Hello and welcome. This is the Stop, Reflect, Verify podcast. I'm your host, Mark Kaigua, and I'm the founder and team leader at StopReflectVerify.com, the misinformation quiz that helps you spot in the times that you've been fooled into forwarding, tricked by the trends, or even shamed into sharing. I have a special guest here with me today. I have Caroline Kimutai. She is the digital managing editor at the Standard Group. Standard Media Group or Standard Group PLC is a regional multimedia organization with investments across radio, print, TV, and online. That's what we're here to talk about today. She's also the former president of the Rotary Club of Nairobi East and the founding editor at tuko.co.ke, the online publisher. Carol, welcome. Thank you, Mark. So I'm excited to have you here. I think that we don't have people like yourself perhaps talking as much with me about how media works because you're so busy actually reporting and coordinating great teams of people following a really great process to publish and share factful and important information that's been checked and is in the public good and interest as part of the fourth estate or the media. But if we take a step back, tell me how you describe what you do to let's call them a retired person or an older person in your life, how would you explain what it is you do day to day? Wow, that's a very interesting question. I normally say I'm in the business of news. Uh, the only difference is, unlike um, my older colleagues who are in print or radio or TV, uh, older media, uh, I am in the digital space, but my training is actually in print media, so that's my foundation. So I'm still in the business of news, only that now it's what we call, quote-unquote, hot media. Mm. Yeah, Awesome. So in terms of your work, the Standard Group has been known in some ways as somewhat of a trailblazer and also just, uh, you know, not just with hiring and having you part of the organization, but even in terms of misinformation, has had a dedicated desk or section focused on that. How did that become a part of your editorial strategy and what you chose to do besides the everyday news we know and have come to expect? So um, I actually set up the fact-checking desk and the standard group. So what happened is in 2018, I got into a fellowship, um, a U.S. government fellowship on fact-checking. And I had the privilege of traveling to the U.S. and actually interning with PolitiFact. And that's where my love affair with fact-checking started. Um, we had a whole month of training, of visiting uh, various institutions, uh, learning about how they fact-check. We uh, went to the Missouri school and just sat and you know, uh, were taught about fact-checking, podcasting, uh, even running a newsroom with, with fact-check. And then for a week, I was under um, um, a fellowship with PolitiFact. So I was taken through what vigorous, rigorous fact-checking is. So when I came back, I said, you know, um, apart from normal reporting and verification, why don't we take it a step higher and start fact-checking? Um, so I learned the processes of fact-checking. You fact-check a claim, not a person. You fact-check what they say. So if I say, for example, one of the fact checks I did well there was something that um, this comedian, what's his name? Um, I forget his name. <laughs> a comedian who had said that if you live with someone for six months, you're actually married. Uh, a Kenyan comedian. Kenyan comedian. He's thin. <laughs> Sorry to ah, that. Um, um, I'm going to say uh, Jigush. Is he an online guy or Eric television? Omondi. Eric Omondi, yes, the yes. comedian, yes. So, and... You know, he has a lot of following. He has a lot of people who believe him. Right. So I actually fact-checked that and found out uh, what does he really mean. Mm. I called him. He actually said, yes, I meant this. And I talked to lawyers and there's common law and there's a um, uh, 2017, I think, uh, marriage act. Mm. So if common law means if you've stayed with someone for some time and the society knows you as husband and wife, you're actually married. So he was... Uh, let's say there's an 
there's a meter, a truth meter. Yes. Um, who was, let's say, almost true. Right. So there's a truth meter. That's right. And, and uh, you know, I shared it with him and he was like, oh, I didn't even know. Because in the fact check, you look at the um, common law, you talk to a lawyer, you talk to the marriage act. What is the context? You look at the law and some of the presidents that have been there. Mm. And you actually now pass it through a senior editor. And that's what they do. I found that very interesting at PolitiFact. They have an echo room where you pitch as a fact checker, you pitch your fact check oh, wow. to four senior editors who actually grill you in terms of whether you checked different aspects of the claim. Uh, we are not the, uh, yet there here, but that's something I really, really hope I can do uh, before I retire. <laughs> that's excellent. Yes. That's so, excellent. <coughs> so it was a very good experience. I brought it back and mm. I, I trained a few editors in the newsroom. Uh, one of them even went to AFP. I'm, you know, I felt really bad, but I, you know, I said, you, you do good. And so now in 2020, when we are converging the newsroom, mm-hmm. we actually had, a, we have a desk called a checkpoint desk. So ah. it's fact checking, research and investigative. So I, am, I can say I'm very happy that at least now it's formally in the strategy of the business, the editorial strategy, that checkpoint is a key desk in the newsroom. That's right. And I think we had the Stop, Reflect, Verify launch recently. We had uh, uh, Patrick Vidija from your team join us and, and be with us on a panel. So something I, I, I might just ask quickly is I had never seen how investigative reporters just with the timeline they need to have to uh, put together a story, in some ways they make, and I, I'm assuming this, please correct me, do they make really great fact checkers because in a way they, they sort of are scrutinizing these uh, sort of slow burn news. They're not like their pieces tend to take sometimes days or weeks or even months to put together all the moving parts, sense check. And I imagine those types of stories have to go through risk and legal just before you put out a big investigative piece what was the thinking with adding that investigative element to the checkpoint desk i think the uh, the difference between investigative and uh, fact checking is this um investigative you have a hunch so you're going to look for something so you're getting all the paperwork you're confirming you're verifying and so on and so forth fact checking i actually call you because if i'm investigating you say for crime x I will call you and get your side of the story. But if I am fact-checking, I'll ask you, Mark, did you say this? And what did you mean? What was the context? So, for example, um, during the presidential debate, they said all sorts of things. So you can actually call uh, Justina from Roots Party and say, you said that we are going to export X amount of venom to this market. I cost this. What did you mean? And they tell you, this is what we meant. Now, if I'm investigating, I might not have the luxury. I might just call Justin and say, uh, there's uh, claim that you're illegally exporting, it's an example, right. uh, a million liters of venom. Is it true? And she'll say, no, 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 no. This isn't this. But if it's fact-checking, you said this in a public space. Right. Um, you're on record, you said it, but we ask you, what did you mean? Mm-hmm. What was the context? Because sometimes... And people are actually quoted out of context because, you know, um, he might say we are going to end debt. But if you don't probe and ask what is the context mm. of your claim, you're actually not giving the, the people reading your content the whole picture. Right. So fact checking, you give the whole picture that he says, I'm going to end debt in a day. That's okay. How much debt, what context, and from where. Then he sets the context, and then now you drill down and say, okay, fine. How much debt, if I am supposed to divide it by 30 days in Kenya? And then they say, okay, fine. Each uh, The cost of debt per day is maybe um, 500 billion. Right. And you actually find out that actually it's true. If we sell X Haina parts, right. you can actually pay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, awesome. And, and I think even... As a journalist and editor, how is it that you might help an everyday, what we call mananchi, ordinary citizen, out there just trying to make ends meet? How do you explain to them misinformation? And does it ever come to the point where you find yourself having to almost explain to them what it is? Because they know the news and they know the standard media group, been around 100 years. 
But in this world outside of the, the the newspaper, the radio, print, and online, how do you explain, I guess, this this other side of what they're encountering? Yes, you see, misinformation is information shared deliberately uh, with the objective of misleading people. Mm. And now with the elections, you see a lot of that in WhatsApp groups. Let's take an example of something I saw yes uh, last week of a post that was under NTV. And someone had claimed that two politicians are in trouble because some money was stolen and so on and so forth. So it was shared in a group and someone asked, is this true? But knowing it's election time, first of all, I could smell that this guy was actually deliberately sharing that. So I, I responded on the WhatsApp group and said, if you even read the English, it's the normal market English. It's Najwa, we say Udaku. Yeah. So I said... Common sense, he didn't take it well. I said, common sense should show you that this is actually like even written from Kiswahili or mother tongue to English. Mm. You know, they even put, you know, some language, you know, it. Uh, apparently we hear so-and-so has done this, has used county money, allegations. I'm right. like, if you actually read mainstream news, this is not how we write, mm. first of all. Number two, that English is just even a class two can write better. Mm. Number three, the font. Number four, just go and check on NTV and check the feed. And, you know, they even said uh, the name of the politician plus his nickname. We don't write that. If I know you as Makaigua MK, I can't write that on a tweet. Even if you're friends, mm. it is Mark Kaigua Nendo. Government names. Yes, government mm -hmm. names. This is a media house. I mean, we know you as those official names, not your Mta names. So he didn't take it well, but that's how you pull, you tell people, you know what, by the way, just stop and think. Mm, mm. Some things are just common sense. This is, you know, I read it and I was like, this is market gossip. I don't come from that part of the county, but you could see. And you, you've touched on something that in each of our podcasts so far we've been looking at, which is how for the misinformation and disinformation bad actors there's almost always a graphic designer present in the sense that they're there to manipulate photographs or to come up with these caricatures and comics or to, even in the case that I wanted to discuss, take a quote and take your exact style as a media house and then change the font and then, you know, make these tweaks and adjustments um, and then obviously go out and sew their own narrative so i think the 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 aspect for me you know is with with media we're not just seeing this for still images like you've talked about that quote where you're sure it's asking them look at the font look at the way that this is written look at the way the person that's actually in a way a group education because i, I like the fact you did it in the group because sometimes people will do it you know privately but if that that person sometimes knows what they're doing like you're saying where they they feel that way and they're finally like i have the validation let me share this but let me ask if it's true or as kenyans like to say sent has received but i wanted to ask about doc doctor or manipulated videos this is something that there's not even that many people who've been able to speak on this but some people are going back and finding a clip you know from the news taking that and adding their own context or what we've seen in some later fact checks it's perhaps vernacular or it's swahili but the subtitles are being changed. There's now a whole video aspect uh, to this. What for you, either on the still images being doctored or the videos, is how you, I guess, trying to either uphold trust or encourage people to better spot. So people like that, that gentleman in that uh, WhatsApp group or that person doesn't fall for this as hard as it is. What, what I've noticed, at least in the last couple of years, that people who are out to misinform and to share fake news know what they're doing. Mm, mm. So what they do is they ride on trusted brands. So they'll take a um, trusted brand, they'll take a media house, they'll take a blog, and they will manipulate. So we've seen even newspaper headlines. Um, you know, like the Nairobian has been, um, uh, you know, one of the victims of such. Someone will take, and if they, I have a vendetta with you, I'll put your picture, manipulate the headline, and put a very, very bad headline there. And actually release it on Friday when the Nairobian goes out to press. So these are very, very intentional people, mm. very clever. And, you know, we have to pick it up. We have to uh, blight it because the more you reshare it, the more, you know, it goes round and round and round. So we have to mark it fake, first of all. And we keep... Uh, advising readers, please, before you share, come to the standard website or come to the standard Twitter page on Nairobian 
and check again. Stop reflected verify. <laughs> yes. So mm. that's a standard um, quote that we use onto videos. Again, um, very, very clever, but you have to use your senses. Mm. You have to watch it. And most of the time we watch and forward. We don't stop and ask, okay, is, is, is this really true? Mm. Okay. Uh, there was one of the ICC, I don't know if you remember, where apparently Paul uh, Gishiro pleaded guilty. We almost fell for that. If So what I told my guys, just listen and close your eyes. And you could hear the jump cut. Wow, wow. I just explained for people who don't know a jump yes. cut, wh- what like it is. He, uh, he says, I plead, stop guilty. And there's a tiny pause in there yes. in the audio track, basically. Yes, yes. And you can even see the transition. Sometimes watch a video two, three times, mm. even a, a mute, and just see. Uh, you're going to see a lot of manipulations. Uh, the sound, I'm sure a lot of Obama videos have gone around with his voice. It's very possible to overlay. Mm. But you just watch the mouth and, and you'll see. And, and if something doesn't make it's shocking, highly likely it's fake news. That's right. Yes. I if mean, it's, if mm. it's you're like, oh, what? Before you forward, um, ask, side chat someone. Like the nation one, I even had to send it to the editor and say, I hope you know this is circulating. Please mark it fake. Uh, because if, if we don't help each other as mm, media houses, mm. uh, I might think their brand is mm-hmm. suffering, but really it is a, uh, the, the, the journalism brand that is suffering mm. across board. So videos are, are the latest deep fakes where people will go to great lengths to manipulate crowds, to even manipulate um, you know um, voices and they show someone is being chased by this community. And in the background, you're hearing uh, these uh, slogans for the other political party. That's right. Go home, go home. And really, it's not even, it didn't happen then. It's a, it's a picture or a video that is, you know, six, seven, ten years old. Mm. And right now, I'm sure it's one week to election. I am so damn sure. Tuesday, w- uh, Wednesday, you're going to see old photos of 2008. That's right. That's right. People have to be vigilant, yes. We have to be vigilant, mm. yes. Mm. Pictures of, you know, Tanzania. You've seen all those That's pictures. That's right. The, the, the Congo Brazzaville. Some yes. of these photos have been debunked so yes. many times that, yes. that this photo is not Kenya. Yes. This security guard yes. and that, that altercation yeah. with someone yeah. is not Kenya. Yeah. But, but, but yet again, because it's maybe been four years, like you're yes. saying, in the, in the making, people could forget and be like, oh, no, look, I knew this would happen, right? Yes. Playing into the fears yes. um, yeah. of, of, of others. Yeah. So I, I guess if we take a step back, we're talking almost from this place of traditional or broadcast media on this end and looking out there at the audience and somewhat in between as the new intermediary is social media. And for some, they've demonized social media. Oh, you know, it's like nothing good can come of that. You know, these generations is wasting their time, etc. But for others, they're saying, look, you know, this is where I get my news. This is where I'm going to, you know, learn about the world. So there's an element here for me where the what are called the gossip blogs or um, what you might call the tabloid newspapers or publishers, they have this fine line that they walk on, which some of the the more established and trusted news um, brands won't touch really or will will hardly really play into. So I, I'm curious in terms of the role of of gossip sites because they are feeding and and satisfying a need a need for entertainment and gossip uh, yeah essentially gossip and and uh, and celebrity culture right in music entertainment sports uh, and even sometimes the political realm uh, but but how how would you explain to people how to consume gossip because that same vehicle for gossip sometimes can be the same railroad tracks that misinformation is walking where like you're saying if you can't spot that even if it's the nairobian we don't do this like we 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 won't speak in these terms on a certain story yes we have some liberties there but help people understand the hat you must wear if you're on let's call it the tabloid side which is genuinely i mean we take someone like edgar obari the kenyan um uh um let's call it uh you know 
<laughs> deepreneur or like you know he's basically publishing gossip and has a paid community that's you know uh, doing pretty reasonably well if you look at his, his premium channel on telegram and for anybody who's hearing about this for the first time he had his instagram basically taken down opened a telegram account that was free rose up to north of a hundred thousand users and then opened what he called a, a premium channel where people had to basically pay to get in to subscribe to that but he's not the first. We've had the last 10, 15 years, we've had very mature and, and with most respect, very high selling and very important uh, publications. So coming back to it, social media and appetite for gossip. How do people follow that but not get misled in the name of their appetite for, for gossip? Yeah, you know, um, the difference between those uh, bloggers and mainstream, first of all, we also get that information. Now, okay, so let's a not think you don't get it yes, too. Yes, a lot of information is, is known, but the question we ask is it, what is the public interest? If I get divorce papers, so-and-so is divorcing and asking for X amount, there are children involved. Mm. So there are professional ethics we look at. Like I said, what is the public interest? What is the public interest in us writing about Mark? Yes, we have the court papers and your divorce and 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 your children to what end is that and so that's the difference while we might want to write it there are certain ethics that guide us in the practice of journalism so that's one number two yes uh, there is an interest for gossip but most of the time people come to mainstream to confirm whether it's true is it true that this and this is happening is it true and what is the extent of that truth? Because when we decide to do a story, of course, we'll give you the evidence that we went and checked, so and so this has happened, uh, or the matter is in court, like we saw the Willie Kimani murder. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the matter was in court, um, the judgment was read, we will show you what happened. This cop was even eating a machoman, asking, have you finished? That's not gossip. That is a testi uh, mm -hmm. testimony that was shared in court and we'll put it. Does Edgar use that information? No. Why doesn't he use that information? Mm. So you ask yourself, why is he publishing certain information to what end? Yes, there are people who complain uh, this company has done this or the other, but what is the public interest in that? Mm -hmm. And you know, I would say I would stretch it, do an investigative piece, find out if this is happening, um, so that you help the society in terms of unethical practices in company X, Y, Z. But we all know investigative journalism is not cheap; it's expensive. Right. Uh, so what people do is just touch the surface, and then um, don't give people both sides of the story, because if I excuse you of X, I need to talk to the person who is accused of the crime or the or mistake, what is the full story? So that, that is what misses. And unfortunately, you have a, a lot of people consuming that information. But in the end, is it a sustainable model? That's the question. You can only bastardize people for so long until they realize, okay, these 200 shillings, I might as well use it for something different. And so I'll, I'll pay for content that is solid content. Gossip will always be there. There's a space for gossip in our society. But you also have to ask yourself, um, you know, for how long? And so what if I know Jane is sleeping with Tom? So what? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and, and here, you know, I, I want to be clear, we're using, uh, you know, we mentioned Edgar Barry, but like I said, just really as a microcosm of what, uh, like you like you rightly pointed out it's interesting to see how you know yes kenyans vote with their time and their attention you know as they visit certain websites but to see how they voted with their wallet for his brand of gossip but like you said it's not infallible and there's definitely you know room for him to grow and i think one of the challenges he's wrangling with is is almost a very vocal part of that community that has a very high appetite and is really challenging him, especially now because they've paid. So now he has to almost like, you know, raise. Previously, he could do it. He could exercise, you know, uh, a level of being judicious. Now he has to sort of, you know, feed his sort of premium audience before coming to the rest. But the lessons you've just said cut across. Because before Edgar and the Telegram uh, expression, everything you said is true of the multiple and they seem like they're cropping up very often. Blogs and sort of tabloid style um, uh, 
uh, uh, basically publishers. I see so many yeah, that maybe, I don't recognize. Even before before Edgar, there was Jacko News. You remember? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Bogonko Bosire. Yeah. He had, uh, but Bogonko, he was a journalist, and you could see his style of writing. The the question, what he was doing, was it ethical? Mm. Was it ethical? So we have many of those around the world, and, mm. and you know about them. Um, the other concern that we really need to be very careful about, you see, yes, people are paying for that content. And as a publisher, we've, we've run a paywall. Mm. And, and yes, people will hold you to account. I'm paying you. I don't want um, just light news. I want depth. Right, right. So for how long will you do that before we start asking you, okay, fine. Um, enough of this. Who said this? Receipts. Enough of receipts. Uh, give us the meat and bones of what you're talking about. Mm. And also remember when um, the theories of mass communication, people use media for their own selfish use. So after some time, the gossip, I re start realizing, okay, what value is it adding to me? So what if I am keeping up with the Kaiguas? Yeah. Then what? Yeah. Then I start asking myself, I'm spending so much time keeping up with you I've forgotten to go back to school. I've forgotten to go back to the gym. I've forgotten so many things to do my work. I'm not promoted. I'm still earning this much. It gets to a point people start reflecting, in, inflecting and asking themselves, okay, fine. Do I really need to spend a lot of time on this? And we saw that during COVID where people started getting stressed by social media. Uh, these True. socialites, yeah. uh, we started unfollowing because it's vanity. It's fickle. It's... It's just for showbiz. And, and we've seen that. And we've seen how uh, people have come and gone. Uh, with all due respect to Aziad, where is she now? It's a passing cloud. Because at the end of the day, people ask themselves, okay, fine, I'm paying all this for 200 shillings? Uh, it's not worth it. So mm -hmm. you need to have a long-term strategy if you're doing mm -hmm. gossip, mm -hmm. a sustainable long-term strategy. For sure. And I think even just to speak to that, I think, for me, what's so interesting with, with Aziad is, you know, not that it just started with the TikTok and, and the dance to the, the major song at the time. But after that, I th you know, what's interesting with, with her case, if I just isolate her for a second, is that it moved from that towards, um, like you said, becoming sort of a social media public figure. And then, and this is always important for me because people underestimate this, going towards traditional media because I believe she's a radio host now. Mm -hmm. So now she has what you would call either citywide or nationwide, you know, terrestrial radio reach, in addition to everything she does online, in addition to some of the influencing jobs. And I mean, even she's gone into much. Uh, we, we follow creators quite a lot. So I know I've, I've looked at just with the work we do at Nendo um, and just looking to sort of the business of, of creators um, and the, e the economics of it. So I actually think in some ways that was the... There's many people who I'd say are, are a flash in the pan. I think for her, she's leveled it up uh, in a very interesting way to sit on a, you know, in front of basically a microphone that's broadcasting and yes. that only echoes and then builds up the online. In somewhat similar fashion, I think there was a season where uh, Sharon Mundia, known as uh, This, this is, is S, she went and started hosting a breakfast show, which for some is somewhat of the, the journey. In fact, for me, I say the biggest sort of online content creators, right, in, in big air quotes, tend to be the faces in front of our screens because they have nationwide reach first. Yeah. In fact, I did a, a, a piece, and I, I'll, I'll find out when it's coming out, on why I think there's a few races, electoral races, where it'll be very interesting to see if social media people achieve the outcome because the people I know who have a greater shot than them with the most respect, are traditional media journalists because they have, again, uh, we were talking about this before the, the, the mic started rolling, so I'll say it here. If you take Facebook, Facebook, the biggest social network in Kenya, 15 million monthly active users, half of them are in Nairobi. So even if you talk to half of all Facebook people in Kenya, you're still only talking to Nairobi, whereas yes. if I get 10 minutes on one of your radio shows, I have a national platform Correct. in inarguably at least the five to seven biggest counties, if not the entire nation for a certain section of people. So I think, you know, Standard Media Group for me in its radio, in its TV, in its print will have, I, I, I hate to say it because some people think, but you talk about social media nicely, but you then challenge it and say that it's not what it's built up to be. I think it has value. I just think it struggles with reach outside of urban areas. Cool. And that's why I think um, traditional media is not going to go away. So coming back to it, if we talk about Twitter, one of the things with the last election, was, 
And I actually, oh, you know what? It's <laughs> so funny. Last night, and you, I, 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 I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but last night I'm looking at the standard. And, uh, and and please correct me. I hope I don't get this wrong. But but there's a piece on Gideri man. Yes, it's behind a paywall. Yes, and it's how he's he's gone through a hard time. So yes. for everybody listening, the one of the things which was both I think very interesting and also quite challenging about the media ecosystem is it's it's August I think it was eighth two thousand and seventeen. The, the whole country of Kenya is going through the general election. And on social media, I think someone takes a photo of this gentleman holding a polythene bag. I think the ban had not happened. And it had Gideri, which is a, 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 a yeah, amazing beans, like staple. And this guy, it starts a nationwide almost like manhunt in the media, social media. The brands get involved making memes about yes. him. He gets endorsements. Basically. And head of state commendation. A head of state yes. commendation. <laughs> like it was this full, basically media cycle to where he's meeting all these politicians. Some people, People, however, interpreted that and the fanaticism the whole country showed as, and, and I don't think it was fully fair to be quite clear, it, there's, a, there's nuance, but they said, okay, the media is, is sending us on this wild goose chase and they started labeling the media as Gideri media, right? Meaning, okay, you are serious, but sometimes in matters of issues, you also have these frivolous pursuits you have. That came from Twitter, in my understanding. I even wrote a Twitter thread at the time. So where I'm going with all of this is I think there's, there was that fanatical focus on him. Later, Kenyans went to the point they did their own KOT news at nine. We've seen the traditional media get a blackout and, and people say, you know, we don't need the news. I think the news is pretty important, even though I might not watch it every day. I know it has a staple with what we call the appointment viewing. It's still there. Now, all of this is a way of saying, how do you strike a balance at entertaining Twitter and social media activity, which leads to a Gideri man, a story that has this, you know, you, it's there, and I love that it's behind a paywall because now I have to pay to get that news. Um, uh, but but on the other side, you have Twitter asking for substance and serious news and also also saying, you know, we don't need you. So how do you strike this balance with what I think is social media's most demanding audience, the Kenyans on Twitter or the Twitterati? Because they are the ones who labeled, you know, the media, Gideri media, which somewhat has stayed, but it's it's not used as much. But it's a, it's a criticism of this idea that come election day, Will there be a, some distraction from the true news at hand? How do you how do you balance that with you and your team? Yes, uh, that's a good story. We published it over the weekend, and I remember I was involved in that. And I said, you know what? It's a week to election. Let's look for this guy. So you found him, and the typical Simon Maconde story: born on Sunday. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, he is uh, oh no. you know an old shadow of himself. Oh shame. Um, Huru gave him a hundred k. He can't account for it. Mm. You know, s typical story of uh, fame and then overnight, fly by night and back to, you know, where you are. Um, so he says this year he'll be on the queue again with Gideri and Porridge. But uh, that's not the story. It's important we revisit. For me, I think the idea of publishing that story was we did it five years ago. We've gone back to tell Kenyans. Here is this guy. Right, right. The same Kenyans ran and you clothed him here. I think he was even modeling for some designer That's guys. That's right, with the designer suit yes, and all. and all that. Where are those guys who were working with him? Okay. Mm. So, and that's what I was saying. Sometimes these social media things can be um, bright lights and then after some time they dim. And Twitter can be very noisy. Very noisy. In fact, uh, we use it for monitoring, like an echo for us, to pick things, to follow things. But sometimes, if you're not careful, you might clutch onto a trend that is an empty trend. And we have bots now. You, you've, you've been reading the issues that Elon Musk has been having with Twitter, uh, fake accounts, and you know what it takes to trend. We just need to be how many of us in this room uh, talk about something for 20 minutes, and we push it, tag our friends, and we are trending. Okay, so it's we need to be very careful. Even these opinion polls that people do, can you vote for Caroline or Mark? On twi the Twitter ones, right? Yeah. And sometimes I see thousands, and <laughs> even even in the mainstream media, we see sometimes thousands of people voting on these polls. And I mean, sometimes I'm always like, "This is Twitter. This is Twitter. This is Twitter." Yes. <laughs> Use it for engagement. Right. Use it for engagement, engagement, engagement. Mm. Don't take those polls seriously. Mm. They are not scientific. The sampling, you know, I don't want to go into all Correct. opinion polling, but we use it. It depends on what you want to use Twitter for. Mm. 
push a trend, inform people. And you saw during the presenter debate, we actually communicated on Twitter. Yes. Yes, we pushed it, we tagged people. It was the first point of information before sharing the press releases with media houses. Mm. It was intentional. Because you're seeing if, uh, you know, the, some of the politicians who said they were not coming were communicating on their social media That's hand, right. handles. So it's, it's a platform to communicate. How do you use it? What do you want to use it for? So as, as publishers or media houses, you have to decide we want to use this. Uh, platform Twitter for this. We want to use Facebook for this. We want to use IG for this. Excellent. I think I think that is, I think one of the interesting things because when I was contrasting, um, you know, in 2022, you go back to 2002, and that general election in Kenya, if the political um, uh, party wanted to 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 call a press conference or issue a statement, they had to call the standard media group. They had to call any of the other media houses and then you arrive at the press conference or they send a letter or a fax or whatnot. Nowadays, just if you take this example of the presidential debates, you have basically each political party is its own media because if you follow that and you've made up your mind, sometimes you might not choose to follow the, the, yeah. the traditional press. So there's a way where people can almost self-select for their own version of, of the update. Um, and then you're almost trying to follow certain influencers who've picked a side, and then you're getting all the talking points and all the jabs, or you're seeing... You both know, sides. You can correct. follow both sides. If you want to follow Mutahi, if you want to follow uh, Welie, all of those guys, you can follow them. But also, watch IBC. The whole Venezuelan fight was fought on Twitter. Tell me more about it. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Who, who has been caught? Right. BCI. Correct. You remember? Correct. IBC, I'm told now, they, they shook hands and they are friends. It was a whole night we were following, you know, someone has been caught. Um, the CI says this, IBC said the other, That's right. uh, who was arrested. You know, all these things come out. Uh, um, the CI published a whole nine pager. And then even later, a thread. I mean, like, I just, mean, yeah, yeah. Yes, and you can see even the DCI pages, it is a thriller novel. Um, whether it is th those cases go to court is a different story we can talk about another day. But we're also very careful that, yes, it's good information, good entertainment. I think there was one last week around, even so one over which doctor. Yeah. And I was like, what? There's this court of public opinion yes. where these stories are being almost shaped in a way. And even now they've got yes. illustrations. And so yes. the DCI is the yes. Directorate of Criminal so Investigations here. moving that way. But remember, you read there, but you will. we ask ourselves, where are the court papers? Correct. Have they been received? If it's an affidavit that has been sworn, I have sworn that Mark wants to kill me. Have you responded? We are not. I, we, we rarely touch affidavits. Mm. That's a live wire mm. because I can swear and claim anything. Right. I can say I can actually, but there swearing an affidavit is very easy. You know that. Mm. I can actually claim you tried to kill. And you have a sworn and affidavit right here. Stamped, received the judiciary. You take it to the media. They publish it. Mm. That's a legal case. It's there's libel. There's oh. basically a whole network of things there. Yes. So this is, I guess, the public interest, the professional yes. ethics, yes. the right of reply for yes. both sides, yes. and the balance that. Yes. Have that you responded? Mm. Yes. Um, is it true? What are you claiming? If not, we don't touch it. We wait yeah. for you to respond. So let's take a step back and think about the digital publishing world. And I'll ask you to sort of maybe look in the rearview mirror or talk through. Um, like you said, you know, you, you have the journalism background, but um, uh, Genesis, the parent company of, of a publisher called Tuko.tiroke, which is among the larger online uh, digital publishers now. What were some of the insights at that time? Because that was sort of a non-radio, non-TV, non-print publisher. I mean, if we look at someone like Lin Goge, she has gone from a host of, uh, within the sort of Tuko umbrella of, oh, you're going to host our YouTube series, some of these stories on everything from witchcraft to things where there's an appetite for it and you're basically taking one person's view, it's going straight to YouTube, build her up to the point she's now essentially got what you know we would call the Lin Goge Network. You know, who knows, she could be our Oprah, etc. Many people have risen through the ranks at Tuko to go on to do interesting things. What was the learning with, with starting a completely new publisher? Because there are people, as we've said, cropping up all the time. So there might be some lessons even for people who are listening or watching this as to, hey, this is a name I don't recognize. 
are there some 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 trust signals or are there some ways to to build up a new publisher because you could speak to it from multiple angles I, i'd love to hear what might stand out to um to to you yeah yeah genesis is actually a tech company and it was one of the deal makers for me to go and work because i knew you can't learn digital uh journalism in a class mm. you learn by doing so I, it was a great opportunity sitting with developers sitting with all these programmers sitting with all these techies who understand how humans think and behave so we saw an opportunity of uh in the market um the mainstream had ignored the younger people there was uh back in 2015 um the mobile phone everyone was on mobile Uh, the websites were pretty mundane the load speeds were slow i mean the, they were not built for mobile so we came into the market as a mobile publisher and and back then i remember when we were doing the site we were using wordpress and you know we'd publish we'd play around with headlines we'd uh, look at a story and make it viral and look at a story and say okay fine this is it's in the story but these guys missed the nose of the story mm. is about this and i see that a lot of that happening and now uh, more and more publishers are using it but it's also been af- abused you know you know uh, number two will shock you and all that kind of stuff right. clickbaiting clickbait has gone into clickbaiting has gone into again publishing of fake news where it's a fake headline you click and it's all sorts of crazy things there yeah but it was a good thing because we we came in and we started talking to the younger um yeah, audiences who were essentially not had stopped reading the paper had stopped watching the news um and we started aggregating we first of all started by aggregating and you know you'd have your phone and um your app would pop and breaking news so again we came in speed and something would happen would repackage it and pop it up that's how we grew the brand and of course at the beginning people didn't take us seriously i remember I was recruiting and you, mm. you you know people from the mainstream would come and you could see they're not sure you know if you don't give them how much they want but there are few people who actually risked and joined the business and you know i mean they are running some of the news newsrooms uh, in in the country so it was just a matter of 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 looking at the space where was the market then what can we do better and i'm happy to see that you know we have uh, the standard of course you have the nation you have citizen and and they have serious digital departments and you know the breaking news the speed now right um they are competing with tv competing with radio and you know that's how the landscape changed and now we even have publishers with paywalls you know we have lean you know she's starting her own um uh, she's a vlogger uh, if you, you might say storytelling we have tiktokers now using storytelling we have podcasters right you know yes. it's just hope it opened a whole new set of uh, of spaces we have alanamo yes uh, yes he's a content creator his content is going on 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 tv i mean he's a whole publisher so i think it's a good space to be for me i tell people when i talk to them and young people have depth I can bet Alan will go the long haul. His depth mm. is essentially a, a, a journalist and animal. He knows what a good story is, he knows the ethics. So if you want to get into it, um have some depth. At least have some basic journalism grounding and ethics. I think you'll go far, you'll get a niche and you'll succeed. Now something interesting I think with um with with that is When you think about the economics of publishing, digital publishing, you talk about Tuko something that for me I find so interesting is how one of my grandmothers who I should add is in let me say a county adjacent to Nairobi, so a, an urban area is literate because obviously you know those that, that's an important caveat because it don't sound like everybody's grandma or sure sh- is in this <laughs> this this sort of position but i was look she got a smartphone a couple years ago and i was looking and i saw the tuko app and i watched what happens with the notifications is all is always stuff going on in her notifications the other day she she <laughs> trying to do something on her tv and what not and I, and she gave me her phone and I, and i looked and i was like wow there's a way that she is not only consuming but having things sent to her now i never asked her if 
it was installed for or she installed it. But this idea of the app as a spot for news, which moves it from I get the paper or I visit this link to you're popping and pulling me in. Anything you can say about that? And you can say it from from either a, a Tuko perspective or like you've said, you know, standard and higher benchmarking amongst the other um, established and, and mainstream broadcasters. Anything there on this idea of either breaking news or um, how you... You, you, you basically pull people into the news as opposed to the what they call, I guess, the appointment of the morning paper or the one o'clock or seven o'clock news. Remember when I started, I said Genesis is a tech company. They understand the psyche of the human being. Mm. That strategy is actually to grow the numbers of users outside Nairobi. Your grandmother ordinarily would not download an app. Yeah, correct. You and I will look at apps that add value to us. Correct. So highly unlikely that you will have a publisher's app. I think I have two or three. And you're in the media. I'm in <laughs> the media. It's your job. So yes. And you have because only I two figure, or three. Okay, fine. Yeah. If it's local news, I probably know more than the average user. True. So I'll download an app for a market I'm not there. Mm. A solid app. So maybe the New York Times or I'll do the BBC. And I'll know that is the only app that gives me holistic news. Mm. Back to your grandmother. So she got this phone i'm sure it's an infinix phone it has a preloaded app and because she does not the other app she's on is on whatsapp it will keep popping because they know her behavior and you know she's in the farm or she's in her chamber or she's in church it will pop and she'll read exactly i've seen that with my elderly aunties i went to visit uh, some weeks ago they are retired teachers. So we are sitting, and I think there was a political rally. I don't know where Ruto was. Mm. And my aunt is updating me. I'm like, I'm a Sema. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, even in my own office, what's up? My reporters haven't posted. Wow. I say, I'm a Sema. I'm a Sema. I'm a Sema. I'm like, she is, she's with it. She's watching the videos. She's mm. whatever. In. She's on FB, courtesy of this app ecosystem. Correct. Right? So how many of your grandmothers and my aunties are there? This is a teacher. She's mm. retired. She's in her 70s. And her phone, she is with it. Like we discussed right. politics at depth. She, ca she can host a political show. Wow. Because yeah. of the news she's consuming All on, regular on her mm. device. Mm. And she's consuming both sides. She's Azimio and she's Uko. It was that time when uh, they, were running, they were about to pick the running mates. Ah. She was like, Nafkiri ni Sabina Chege, ama ni Mathakaroa. And she said on this day, uh, Nani alichukua uh, Aida mm. picked, she had Martha on one hand and she had Sabina and she said, she told those who are mamas, give this older lady the chance. I think it will be Mathakaroa. Wow. Very observant with all these small nuances, I details. Had, I, I yeah. tell her, I'm like, I yeah. never saw that day Aida was in a rally, mm. but she was with it. Mm. And true to form, Martha became running mate and she was like, I told you. And you know what I find interesting about that is that isn't necessarily somebody spending time on social media. No. That is somebody spending time with a digital-led publisher Correct. and and they're meeting their needs and appetite for content yes. without some of the... Because social media is also a place you have to wade in. You yeah, know, In fact, I normally noisy. say it can be noisy and I think this what information pollution or information disorder I have a working theory that... Sadly, Twitter for me has a lot of influence, but it's also one of the most, uh, in, you know, highest in information pollution and disorder for two reasons. One is what I'd call the thumbs for hire, you know, the people who are there to sort of like tweet and make things trend mm -hmm. to the point that I think to some extent, sadly, I'm having conversations with people saying, I don't think you need a hashtag at all because the hashtag is a giveaway of, of some coordinated activity, many times synthetic or manipulated yes, yes. or... Um, or just not grassroots. And, and that's and that's a, I'm happy that's happening because there's always pressure. Like if you're publishers and someone is giving us a campaign, they want to trend. It's a vanity matrix. Thank you, thank you. It's yeah, I've been saying that even vanity. to brands. In fact, yes. I'm like, and and not only don't pay for that, you might not want that because you look at the space that you're sharing those trends in. Yes. And then the other sad part, uh, you know, to your point, uh, which also makes the trending tough, is then you have what I'd call um, trend jackers. Yes, these are. In my opinion, and I've met some of them, well-meaning marketers, but I disagree with their approach. Their approach is how many trending topics are there? 
20. So I'll take all 20 words and, and I'll say iron sheets. Right, iron sheets, my laptop, <laughs> this handbag, these yeah. shoes, and things that have nothing to do with the topic. So even the day of something like the presidential debate where I'm following Kenya, I have one eye on the, you know, yeah. you know on what's happening. Then I'm saying, what are people saying? How are they, how are they responding? What's their perception of Latif or Yvonne or, you know, or, or the deputy president? But I'm having to wade through all these people who are like, oh, this is my chance to hawk my wares. And almost like a digital hawking that's happening. Uhuru Again, highway. yeah, it's this, <laughs> it's this sense of where you're wading through this massive open air market. And that's what you want. But there's a lot, a lot of people in your way where you have to sort of sift through. You're sifting through tweets just to find what are every other day people saying. So I almost want to, to, to come back to the economics of it because... Tell me a bit about what I'd call um, the tabula and outbrain. These are basically um, recommendation engines that work in two ways. On one end, they can take standard media group, whether it's SDE, the entertainment side, or whichever part of the digital family, you know, Farmers TV or whatever, you take whichever digital platform and help you because I'm on one story right now. Let's say the story you talked about earlier, the Gideri Man story. But there are hundreds of other stories that have been published that are relevant. So it can do some deep linking recommendation engine. And then they have ad providers who also have paid for some of this space. Now, one of the challenges I, I, I'd be curious is, on one end, I'd love, you know, if you had liberty to share, like, like, is it, you know, as an ad unit compared to the Googles, how does that, you know, rank? And then for me, the challenge is there's also some misinformation that comes in through this. I've read a trustworthy piece on a trustworthy website that I, I trust, right? I'm legacy 100 plus media provider. I get to the bottom. I have these recommendations for jobs in Canada or for uh, Bitcoin or, you know, so on and so forth. And they tend to be positioned almost like stories. But I'm curious because on one end, it has a purpose, which is deep linking and, and making sure that I stay on your site. But on the other side, sometimes someone can almost hijack it to pass on these sponsored messages. So is there a balance you strike or any, any challenges you've encountered with some of these platforms? As many I just decided to mention too. Yeah, actually you speak from a user uh, side of thing. Yes. And if, if that's something we've been discussing, if you're especially for publishers with a paywall, we want to give our customers a clean feel. Ah, okay. Yes. So it's it's a balancing act and, you know, of course, these are driven by bots. They know what you read and they recommend that. But over time, you're going to see that phased out. Mm. And if you've actually pray, uh, paid to read content, want to make your experience quiet, mm. quiet, mm. clean. Almost ad free? Like a library. Okay. Oh, I like this concept. Okay. Yes. Like a library because out there where things are free. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's like a market. It's you know, it's like the same thing Twitter is everything is there. So what will happen is that's why even the concept of members club. You want to come somewhere, you'll have a drink, you're not afraid of being spiked. Um, no one is coming to get your phone call, your phone number and get you a deal and stuff. You just want to come and have your coffee mm -hmm. and relax. And not talk about the cost of the economy, the debt. Just have a drink with a friend and just look outside the window and talk about that tree. Mm. And that's where we are going. We're going to go there. And I even fear Netflix wants to run ads. Some of us will run away. Mm. Because even on YouTube, it's really irritating. I'm watching and then this ad comes. True. Yeah. And so we are, we are getting there. And over time, you'll see, you'll have to pay for a quiet library experience, which I know a lot of people will not mind. As long as I don't see those... Jobs in wherever, Afghanistan, mm. wherever, wherever. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it comes with more, more uh, media literacy. True. And in this part of the, uh, of the world, we have publishers, of course, struggling with viability. So uh, for now, the tabulas will be there because we need to make a little cash. Mm. But as we go forward, you're going to see now publishers cleaning the experience, cleaning the experience, cleaning the experience, so that when you subscribe, you're sure you're getting quality and you're getting a nice experience to read through content or to watch content. Yeah, I really like that. Um, and as we, we wrap, in terms of your advice, so you're a news publisher, you've been part of uh, the fact-checking desk, you know, Checkpoint, uh, you have this history in sort of the tech side of, of, you know, a digital newsroom. When you're giving essentially some of the most elementary advice, um, how do you tell people, you know, in our way of saying to stop, reflect, verify. What are the, the things 
you you mentioned to people maybe even before they share something where you're just like hey we are this number of days i think it's eight seven days to the election um eight days now when we record this uh but it'll be released in in a, in a couple of days what what do you tell people so that they, they they take out just just that and are like okay you know what i like that you're you're telling me some simple things i can actually do like i said the, the basic rule of fake news uh, circulating is they play on your emotions if a story makes you feel really sad think twice mm. shocked think twice happy excited think twice those are fearful mm. for the longest time this uh, fake news of you know if you're charging your phone and you're talking you've seen that picture of someone was electrocuted right. by <laughs> phone mm. how much voltage can a charger of a phone actually carry hardly any i forget how many I've watts seen, right in my family whatsapp groups i've seen it so many times mm. So you cannot be electrocuted by that wire of a phone. You can't. It's common sense. But it happens because now it 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 plays on your fears. And we'll see a lot of that in the this coming few days. Um this lo- road has been closed. This has happened. Police here and those pictures will come. Mm-hmm. So we must be careful before we share or even ask is this true if you're in a group and there's a journalist side chat them don't throw it in a group because in a group uh, whatsapp now even has plus 500 yeah that's right 512 yeah and how many groups are you in and sometimes you can just see that message don't you don't read the following conversations read more mm, or just even the replies the replies and you just forward to your even your own family group mm. and cause a lot of chaos um so we have to be very very careful um ask go to the police twitter feed check verify um we we'll, we are going to see a lot of uh, uh fake twitter handles and you know it's, it's really easy to um create one create one so i i hope um even as as people in the digital space i like the whole issue of uh fake news conversation we must educate and this is the right time to educate and talk about it fight fake news don't forward Uh, verify confirm if anything is shocking you might even take 10 minutes leave it and then come back mm. and reread it again and again and again uh, before you forward mm. yeah oh, i like that anything that you're working on ahead of the election you were a core part actually i believe you were leading the digital uh, arm um and division that was looking after the presidential debates that just happened here in yeah. Kenya we have election day we have sort of post election coverage anything you want to plug or anything you want people to be looking out for that that you can you can talk about at this time that that you you can build some expectation on yeah we actually working with fact checkers uh we've uh, done um arrangements with fact checkers to fact check we've been fact checking the the speeches by this the claims by the the uh, politicians mm. but also we we'll really really ensure that we are fact checking if this has happened police shooting here we want to be at the forefront of saying this is not true uh we'll just go to the basics in fact it's not even fact checking it's verification right. uh, because we'll have a lot of reports misinformation um going around mm-hmm. uh, this has happened is it true um who an, has been declared winner by IBC and you'll see pictures is it true um IBC we are setting up at Bomas so there's a media center there we'll try and ensure that um we are telling the Kenyans this is the real truth of you know the elections the MCAs the governors and so on and so forth i'm sure you're going to hear of someone has been declared dead you know uh, these things happened mm. uh, uh, politicians enemies will just decide you know Mark has stepped down as governor of Nairobi. Oh. <laughs> Day before the yeah Night right before. right right. Yes. So it's very possible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I want to appreciate you Caroline for joining and uh, getting on this side of the the microphone as as one might say. Um so that's our show and really appreciative for uh, anybody who's taking the time to keep up with stopreflectverify.com, the misinformation quiz and also the stop reflect verify podcast. So we are active on social media and the hope is that you're experiencing and seeing this somewhere or listening to this somewhere across the web. So if you found something valuable, heard something useful, saw something interesting or learned something overall, 
this is one of the things where I hope that you'll actually forward to a friend. You can send this as received and keep up with Stop, Reflect, Verify. That's it for now for this episode. My name is Mark Kaigua. This is Caroline Kimutai. And thank you for being with us.